by the late 1980s, it was clear communism didn't work. The Baltic states of Latvia, Lithuania, and Estonia had wanted freedom since their annexation by the Soviet Union in 1939, with the seeming imminent collapse of the USSR and steps taken to dissolve it by Mikhail Gorbachev, the Baltic states began pushing heavily for independence. In 1986, a revolution began unlike any in the other republics, the Singing Revolution. All three nations had independence movements present around 1986, pushing for self-rule, but these grew exponentially in size when it became known that the USSR was planning to construct a giant nuclear power plant in Latvia and dig massive phosphate mines in Estonia, both projects that would ruin the local landscapes. Anti-Russian ideas were at a high, and the Baltic people were like a ticking bomb. While anti-Soviet sentiment was high though, public expressions of these things was taboo until December 26, 1986. That evening, 300 young Latvians openly protested in the streets of Riga. The revolution had begun. Mass protests broke out in the three states during the spring of 1987. The police and authorities, most of whom were Baltic, rarely intervened in the protests, much to the dismay of Moscow. This caused even more widespread giant protests, such as the one in Riga on June 14th. On August 23rd, the anniversary of the molotov ribbentrop Pact, which allowed the Soviets to take over the Baltic in World War II, massive protests occurred in the three capitals and the people began singing. This is where the revolution gets its name. Rather than violent protests or aggression, the Baltic people would often meet in their respective town square and sing patriotic songs. There was still violence though. Estonia protested the most. Massive Estonian student protests and petitions eventually forced the Soviets to renounce their mining plans in September, but the revolution had already begun. On October 21st, protesters clashed with local Soviet militia in the first violent protest in Estonia. Protests continued through the end of the year and into the spring of 1988. That spring, the Estonian Popular Front, Latvian Popular Front, and Saujudis, or the Lithuanian Popular Front, were founded the first elements of free governments of the Baltic states. Pressure from mass protests forced the leaders of the three nations to legalize the showing of their respective national flags and change the national language to their own. A big win. Soviet troops were elsewhere fighting other independence movements and none could really be spared to suppress the Baltic revolutions. The singing and protesting continued. A major influencer in Estonia was the yearly summer concerts in which many young people attended. The one in 1988 focused almost solely on Estonian independence. The massive public support led to the Estonian government issuing its sovereignty declaration, giving its government and laws power over the Soviet ones in their country. Lithuania did the same in May of 1989 and Latvia in July. Throughout the first half of 1989, protests continued as the populations of all three states got more and more riled up. On August 23, 1989, the 50th anniversary of the signing of the Molotov Ribbentrop Pact, millions of people formed a massive human chain across the Baltic states. It is estimated over 2 million people from all three nations, over a quarter of the entire population of the Baltics, participated in the Baltic Way, as it was called. It ran from Tallinn to Riga to Vilnius. In the city, people held hands along the sidewalk. In the country, people drove out standing on the highways or in fields. A continuous line of people stretching nearly 700 kilometers could be seen from the air, all in an attempt to show their solidarity. This not only achieved that, but brought the Baltic struggle to the international stage. There was no way around it. The Baltic states would be free. The Russian government really had no way to respond to this. That same year in the Lithuanian communist elections, Sajidis won 36 out of the 42 seats, becoming the first Soviet Republic to gain basically full government control. To calm things down, Gorbachev visited Lithuania in January of 1990. This had the opposite effect for him, having 250,000 Lithuanians waiting to greet him by throwing stones and insults at him. The Baltic protests had hit their peak and their desired outcomes reached, as during Latvia and Estonia's elections, the popular fronts all won. On March 11th, Lithuania declared its independence, making Vytautis Landbergis its first head of state. 
On May 4th, Latvia declared its independence, with Ivar's god Manus as its first prime minister. Estonia refrained from declaring independence then, but they did win the election with the popular front owning the most seats. For the first little while, nobody recognized the Baltic states but themselves, and over the summer and fall they made preparations to be seen as authentic sovereign states, national assemblies, unique police forces, and border posts, all of which the Soviet government was trying to sabotage. Towards the end of the year, the Soviet government started to truly realize the Baltic nations were very close to internationally recognized states, and began reacting much more violently. On the 8th of January 1991, the Soviet army was ordered into Vilnius, Lithuania to regain control of the city and the country. On the 10th of January, Gorbachev demanded the impromptu Lithuanian government surrender. They did not, and on the 11th, Soviet special forces paradropped into Vilnius and met the Soviet troops already there, with the intent to capture key positions and buildings. Lithuanian civilians and authorities alike attempted to stop them, but mostly to ill effect. By nightfall on the 12th, the two most important buildings in Vilnius, the Saimas Palace, which was the House of Parliament, and the Vilnius TV Tower, were surrounded by Soviet troops. At 1 in the morning, Soviet troops and armored vehicles began to move on the TV Tower, firing on the protesters in their way. 14 Lithuanian civilians were killed and many more injured that night, as well as one Soviet soldier. In the morning, 52,000 Lithuanian people came down to the House of Parliament and surrounding buildings and built barricades to try and stop the Soviets who were besieging the palace. They then began singing. Despite not having the TV tower, Lithuanian officials and camera crews were able to get the word out, and soon it was being broadcast to the world. All eyes were on the situation at the Saimas Palace. Despite overwhelming firepower and the capacity to easily take the House of Parliament, the Soviet troops fell back, out of Vilnius, out of the country. Lithuanian independence had been secured. In Riga, Latvia, similar things occurred. In early January, Soviet troop movements inside of Riga proper became more and more common. It was obvious something was up. On January 13th, after the events in Vilnius, the Latvian Popular Front organized a demonstration of 700,000 people in the Riga city square. Soviet helicopters dropped leaflets telling people that if they did not surrender the parliament building, they would be attacked. The Latvian people did quite the opposite. Thousands of rural people streamed into the city with materials to join the protesters, and they all built barricades. Hundreds of barricades all across the city, in front of strategic buildings, shops, and on many important streets and bridges. Built with anything from tractors to concrete blocks, and manned by tens of thousands of people aged anywhere between 10 and 80. The people on the barricades were mostly unarmed, uh, besides a few special people and police officers. The police supplied equipment, lumberjacks, firewood, restaurants made food, shops gave out winter clothes, singers provided entertainment. It was truly a national effort. The barricades lasted from about the 13th to the 25th, after which Soviet forces, unable to break through effectively, combined with the fact that the whole world was protesting against the attacks, decided to retreat permanently out of Latvia. During the barricades, two police officers and seven Latvian civilians were killed, as well as many more beaten or injured with non-lethal shots. At least one Soviet soldier was killed, and a few more were injured or captured. On July 31, 1991, the USSR made one last hurrah against Lithuania. A group of soldiers attacked a border post near the town of Medininkai, killing seven Lithuanian border guards. But Lithuania and Latvia were from then on essentially free. But Estonia was kept under a tighter leash. On August 20th, 1991, a failed Soviet coup basically spelled the end of the USSR. Estonia fully declared its independence. A group of Soviet paratroopers in Tallinn then attempted to capture the Tallinn TV tower. They were almost successful, but soon after the tower was surrounded by Estonian volunteers led by Edgar Savazar. After a short siege, the Soviet troops surrendered and fled the country. Estonia declared itself free and Savazar would be the first prime minister. On September 17, 1991, all three nations were admitted to the UN and received international recognition. From then on, the Baltic states of Latvia, Lithuania and Estonia 
we're fully free and independent.